actief et intense entre nos pays. Les liens entre le Canada et les Pays-Bas ont toujours été forts et le resteront. Cette amitié est enracinée dans notre histoire commune et nos valeurs partagées. This building, the Hall of Knights, dates back to the late Middle Ages and is part of the buildings of Parliament. It is a historical place. In 1948, in this hall, Sir Winston Churchill gave his famous address in which he called for European unity. A lesser known fact is that in 1947, Canadian Prime Minister Mackenzie King gave a speech in this same hall before the members of our parliament. Mackenzie King started his visit to the Netherlands in the border town of Putten, the first Dutch village liberated by Canadian troops in 1944. Sadly, it is also the place where the first Canadian soldiers died on Dutch soil. The fallen are buried in the Canadian War Cemetery near berg op -Zoom. And you will visit this uh, memorial place later this uh, morning. Last year, we celebrated <coughs> the 75th anniversary of the liberation of the Netherlands from the Nazi tyranny. Canadian servicemen played a crucial role in this liberation, and more than 4,000 young Canadians lost their lives while fighting for our freedom. The people of the Netherlands will always be grateful for your countrymen's sacrifice. And during the war, the royal family found a safe haven in Ottawa. In 1945, the royal family sent her 100,000 tulip bulbs in gratitude for this hospitality. And this was the start of the famous yearly Canadian Tulip Festival in Ottawa. And the festival claims to be the world's largest tulip festival, displaying over one million tulips annually. And tulips are planted throughout the city in front of the building, uh, also on Parliament as well. The long-standing tradition symbolizes our historic and colorful friendship. During the 1940s and 50s, over 180,000 people migrated from the Netherlands to Canada. Of Canada's 34 million inhabitants, more than a million have Dutch ancestry. And these family ties are also an important part of our close relationship. Canada and the Netherlands uphold the same values. We both cherish human rights and the rule of law. We work closely together in NATO and the United Nations. These days, climate change is on the forefront of national and international policy. And yesterday, the House uh, debated on the Fit for 55 climate package of the European Commission. And the EU aims for 55% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030. The upcoming climate conference in Glasgow will be crucial to reach an understanding on a global level. Prime Minister, we are very interested to hear your views and comments on the challenges our countries are faced with at this moment. It's my great pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you all, Speaker Bergkamp. Speakers, chairpersons, members of parliament, friends, it is an honour to address you today in this historic hall. As was pointed out, Every fall, the tulip bulbs that you, the Dutch people, send us are planted in gardens and parks across Kent, Ottawa. In fact, they went in just last week. And every spring, no matter how long or cold our Canadian winter has been, and it is long and cold, those tulips come up. My friends, we have faith that what we do today will have an impact tomorrow. Because if we sow the seeds of a brighter future, that better day will arrive. That's what Canadian soldiers believed when they landed on the beaches of Europe 80 years ago. It's what they believed as they fought their way to the Netherlands, as they pushed canal by canal, town by town, to vanquish the dark forces of fascism. Later today, I will visit 
the Bergen op Zoom Cemetery, where so many Canadian soldiers were laid to rest. And as I pay my respects to those who made the ultimate sacrifice, I'll be thinking of all that they were fighting for, of the legacy they left. Looking at names like Lloyd MacDonald and Romeo Gagnon will, of course, also be a reminder that Canada is a bilingual country. So this morning, I will be leaning on your famous Dutch multilingualism and staying true to my Canadian bilingualism. Nos deux pays sont unis par des générations de gens qui ont tout mis en œuvre pour bâtir de meilleurs lendemains. Des gens qui ont défendu ce qui leur était cher. Je pense à la démocratie et aux droits de la personne, à la conviction que tous les êtres sont égaux et que l'union fait véritablement la force. Et nous devrions en être fiers, nous devrions nous en réjouir. Mais en fait, c'est pas ce dont je veux parler aujourd'hui. If our two countries are bound together, and I know that we are, it is not only by our shared history, but by our common future. As friends, allies, and partners across the Atlantic, Canada and the Netherlands share a commitment to the brighter tomorrow we want to see and the progressive values that will get us there. The rule of law, belief in reason, the defense of human rights, multilateral institutions that serve the common good by promoting fairness and equality. Of course, you already know that. After all, we're in the home of so many of these ideas and ideals. I think about the fact that long before the Enlightenment swept across Europe, you here in the Netherlands were pioneers of progress, advocating for reason and science as the path forward. My friends, that is still our path. That is what I want to talk with you about today. Our generation faces real challenges, rising populism and extremism, a more unpredictable world, workers losing their jobs to automation, wildfires laying waste to entire towns and sea levels creeping up on entire countries. This is not the world of those Dutch thinkers from hundreds of years ago. It is not the world our grandparents stood shoulder to shoulder together against the Nazi regime. But if online radicalization drives someone to hate their fellow citizen, is it really so different from the intolerance our grandparents sought to defeat? In the shadow of great power competition and authoritarianism, isn't our path forward still the rule of law, universal values, and cooperation? When workers are worried about their future, doesn't the solution remain economies that work for everyone? And as climate change threatens our world, aren't we once again called to step up and defend a brighter tomorrow for our children? Le populisme et l'extrémisme, les inégalités, les menaces pour l'environnement, ces défis ne sont pas nouveaux. Ce sont des enjeux que nous connaissons depuis longtemps et que nous avons déjà réussi à régler à d'autres époques. Alors, il faut se dire que les solutions sont peut-être plus près de nous que nous pensons. Just 10 minutes from here is the International Criminal Court. When we talk about our shared commitment to progressive values, it's hard to think of a better example. After all, a team of Canadians played a central role in setting up this court that now finds its home right here in The Hague. This is proof that we can and have stood up together to injustice, to hate, and to the very worst crimes. And it's proof that we continue to meet these wrongs with the rule of law and with a commitment to the rights of every person. That is the groundwork that, together, we have laid. This is the foundation upon which we can build. At home in Canada, 
We're cracking down on online hate and radicalization while keeping communities safe with measures that protect places of worship and community centers. There must be no tolerance for anti-Semitism, just like there must be no place for Islamophobia or hatred of any kind. And of course, this work goes beyond our borders. I could talk about the new immigration stream we're establishing to provide safe refuge for human rights defenders at risk, including from Afghanistan, yet another place where the Dutch and Canadians have stood side by side in defense of peace and human rights. Or launching a new Canadian centre to promote democracy and good governance around the world. Or the fact that we'll continue increasing our support for institutions and groups that stand up for democracy, for human rights and for international law globally. Je pourrais vous parler de tout le travail que le Canada accomplit à l'égard de la démocratie, des droits de la personne et du droit international. Mais au bout du compte, ça se résume à ceci. Nous savons quel monde nous voulons et nous savons que nous ne pourrons pas le bâtir seul. Our two countries stand alongside each other in the defense of human rights and the rule of law. Canada and the Netherlands are making a joint intervention at the International Court of Justice to ensure accountability for the Rohingya people who have been the victims of genocide. And we're cooperating to hold the Syrian government responsible for crimes against humanity it has committed against its own citizens. The points I've just laid out may seem so obvious to those of us in the room that one could wonder why we even need to say them at all. But in this age of unreason, of disinformation, of skepticism and cynicism, we need to acknowledge that there are those who would tear down what we are building, who stand against these positive values we share. And let's be frank, it's not just conspiracy theorists and marginalized angry people online, it's state actors too, using disinformation, propaganda and cyber warfare to harm our economies, our democracies and undermine people's faith in the principles that hold us together. So we must stand strong and united in NATO, at the UN, and in multilateral fora around the world to meet the threat of authoritarianism with the hard work of democracy, to counter challenges with security and strength, and to show that societies that embrace difference, that welcome open debate and that care about each and every one of their citizens, that those societies ultimately deliver a better present and future for all. We are not on the front lines of a world war as our grandparents were. That does not mean, though, that we can just sit back and assume that the work they started is done. My friends, our work is just beginning. In Canada, we must grapple with the injustices faced by Indigenous peoples for far too long. Government has a real role to play. And that's why we're working hard on everything from clean water to making amends for historic wrongs. But individuals have their part too. Because reconciliation, or for that matter, doing right by any community, is shared work. And I know that our citizens are more than equal to the task. Just think of what we've all been able to accomplish just over the last 18 months. With COVID-19, our world has faced a challenge like we could never have expected. But countries like ours, like Canada and the Netherlands, we're pulling through. There are lots of reasons why. Let's not kid ourselves. We're fortunate that as part of the global north, as trading nations, we've been able to secure the vaccines our citizens need faster than most other countries. But there's another reason, too. And it has to do with the fact that we're places where we look out for one another. Places where we are willing to stay home to protect our neighbors, 
where we know that it benefits us all when the small business down the street stays afloat. Avec le début de la fin de cette pandémie et de cette crise économique mondiale, on a la chance de rebâtir en mieux. Et pour ce faire, nos économies doivent d'abord être fortes, résilientes et profitables à tous. Comme nos pays prônent la libéralisation des échanges commerciaux, il est clair que si nous refermons nos portes, nous ne pourrons pas créer de bons emplois ou laisser nos entreprises croître. Si, dans chacun de nos pays, nous voulons favoriser une prospérité partagée et bâtir une classe moyenne forte, nous devons placer notre confiance dans les échanges commerciaux justes et progressistes. Il ne fait aucun doute que le Canada et les Pays-Bas le savent déjà. Through CETA, we've boosted trades and goods between our two countries by 18% already, while trade and services have gone up by almost 50%. Working together as liberal trading nations pays. It means more good, well-paying jobs for the middle class, more opportunities and customers for our small businesses, more growth for the entire economy. That's why Canada has been leading efforts on WTO reform through the Ottawa Group, because an open, free, fair, and rules-based trading system can drive global prosperity and a stronger middle class everywhere, provided we remain committed to ensuring that the system includes everyone and everyone can reap the benefits. Later today, I'll be sitting down with business environmental leaders to talk about the next chapter in our collaboration, green innovation, clean growth that creates new opportunities for workers and resilient economies for everyone. Mes amis, tout le monde mérite d'avoir un bon emploi. Mais n'oublions pas que ce n'est pas le seul critère que les gens ont en tête quand ils pensent à la vie qu'ils veulent pour leurs enfants et leurs familles. Après tout, à quoi bon une économie forte ou une société ouverte si notre maison a été ravagée par des feux de forêt ou si notre quartier est complètement inondé. Nous sommes devant une crise climatique et nous devons prendre nos responsabilités. Climate change is the test of our generation. To meet it, we have to follow the science, to listen to reason, because if we do anything else, we will fall short. I know you get that. The bikes that are a symbol of the Netherlands are a testament to your commitment. My friends, it's an example we're following at home in Canada with historic investments in bike paths and walking trails. And when it comes to climate ambition, we're on the same page. We've both committed to phasing out coal-fired electricity. We've both put a price on pollution. We're both investing in renewable energy and moving forward on climate adaptation. The world needs countries like ours to stand up for what we believe, to say, yes, this is a crisis, and yes, we can do something about it, to follow the science, to develop new solutions, <clears throat> to lead for our kids. And this coming week especially, we all have a chance to do just that. COP26 is in a few days. I'll be there. I know Prime Minister Rutte will, too. Let's take this opportunity to keep working together, to rebuild good green jobs for workers and leave a bright future for our children. Climate change, inequality, radicalization. These are big challenges, bigger than either of our two countries. So why does it matter? that we talk about this here. Why am I saying all this to you in this historic hall today? This is the same hall where the Congress of Europe was held in 1948, as Canadians joined leaders from across Europe to rebuild after the Second World War. This is the same hall where they made the choice to work together instead of being divided. 
to embrace democracy and human rights against hate and injustice, to believe in reason and progress and reject fear and mistrust. That was their choice, and now this choice is ours. Neither of our countries stands as the biggest or the richest or the most powerful. But building a better world isn't about standing alone. It's about standing together. My friends, let us plant the seeds and bulbs of a better future. And let's have faith in their promise for a brighter tomorrow. Thank you, merci, and gouvel. Thank you very much for uh, your remarks, Prime Minister. Now I would like to give the floor to Ms. Agnes Milder. She is uh, the acting uh, chair of the Committee on Foreign Affairs. Mrs. Agnes Milder. Thank you very much, um, Prime Minister, for your inspiring speech. Uh, it's my privilege to open the floor uh, for the exchange of views with the members of Parliament. And I um, must say there will be a delegation of members of parliament at the COP as well. So we really think that's important. First, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Van Apeldoorn, uh, chair of the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, uh, Defense and Development Cooperation in the Senate. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Your Excellency, it's a real honor to receiving you here uh, in our parliament, also given the historic ties between our two countries, as you so eloquently described in your speech. In my question, I want to focus on, on one of the big challenges that you spoke of, and, and arguably the biggest challenge, that of climate change, as we are on the eve of COP26. Uh, I think for almost all of us, it's really clear the, that there's the uh, urgency to deal with the climate crisis, and that we need to make the transition to uh, a non-carbon economy fast and faster than, than we previously uh, expected. Um, uh, this was also confirmed by the latest IPCC report. We have the uh, high incidence of extreme weather in your country, heat waves, floods in our country and in Germany. Yet there is also growing concern on the part of people, ordinary citizens, about how to pay for this transition and what it will mean in terms of financial costs to households. Um, often in response one hears uh, that the principle should be that big polluters, uh, big emitters of CO2 gases, should pay for the transition. Um, and then we're talking about big corporations. The question is how to make these corporations um, pay uh, for this transition, how to hold them to account. Um, you mentioned CETA, which is actually a controversial investment treaty in, in, in this country, uh, as you know, and also in this parliament. And many critics argue that in CETA you have the problem that investment rights take, uh, investor rights take precedence over climate policy goals. Undoubtedly, um, you would disagree. But my question would be is, more generally, how you see this problem, you also mentioned the growing problem of radicalism and populism, of how to make the energy transition um, uh, a reality, uh, but uh, combine that with social justice and also from the perspective of our important transatlantic partnership. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, obviously, you've touched on a lot of, a lot of different subjects within that, that one question. But it really goes to the point that everything is interwoven. Uh, people's sense of social justice is wound up in their uh, worries uh, about their future and their kids' futures, in their careers, but also in terms of climate. And we do have to recognize that we need to look at everything together. But to take uh, some of those uh, ele elements in, in, uh, in order, uh, first of all, on climate change, um, everyone has to do their part. We know that. Uh, yes, big businesses absolutely carry a significant uh, element of the burden, but big, big businesses also exist ultimately um, to serve citizens, to create products that citizens need to buy. So everything is interconnected. And the most important thing that we have to reflect on is that we move forward in a way that supports ordinary citizens, that doesn't tack on extra costs 
uh, onto families that are already struggling with inflation and a cost of living that is rising, whether it's housing prices or uh, costs of education or childcare. These are things that we need to focus on. Because everybody knows that climate change is real. We have for a long time. It's just consistently in democracies that have to get re-elected and assemble governments it's difficult to make people understand that that requires changing behaviors and it will require costs. And figuring out how to make sure those costs aren't borne by individual families uh, has been the one thing that has held us back in general around the world from the most efficient measure to tackle climate change in our economies that exists, putting a price on pollution. Opponents to pricing carbon have always said that becomes a tax on everything. And what we've been able to figure out how to do in Canada is make sure that that cost is not borne by ordinary families. In fact, with our one of the most broad-based and ambitious prices on pollution in the world, in Canada, we return more money on average to uh, uh, a uh, uh, middle-class family then they actually pay out in a given year, even as we rise to $175 a ton uh, over the coming years, and we will reach our climate goals. And the challenge of Canada is that we are a country uh, that is still a producer of fossil fuels. And while the world continues to need fossil fuels for a number of years, we need to make sure we are leading that transition towards cleaner energy. And those challenges uh, and I hope I'll be able to speak to Sita uh, in a moment in another question. Um, but those questions that drive us forward are absolutely essential uh, and where we all need to show significantly more ambition uh, on uh, uh, next week in Glasgow. Thank you, Prime Minister. Now I would like to proceed to, to the other members uh, of Parliament who indicated that they would like to ask a question. Uh, please uh, use the microphone uh, to the right and keep your uh, questions as brief as possible. <laughs> you can take uh, your seat after having finished your question. And the first one on my list is Mr. Brekomans of the Liberal Party uh, called the BVD in our house. The floor is yours. Our Liberal Party, I would also like to express our gratitude for the strong alliance and friendship between our two countries. And I would like to thank you personally for visiting our parliament and taking the time to have this conversation with us. Um, you spoke beautifully about our common future and about the importance of the rule of law, um, about universal values. And I think what is a big issue is that those universal values are challenged and that they are challenged by the rise of autocratic regimes, and in particular the rise of China. Um, and I would like to ask you how you think we should deal with this. And I think one of the underlying problems is that we have become too dependent on China, uh, whether it comes to raw materials or essential products or technology. Uh, we as the Netherlands and European countries import often more than 80 or 90 percent uh, from China. And it makes it very hard to stand up against China when it comes to security issues or human rights violations. And I was wondering what we as Canada, Netherlands, European countries can do together to make us less dependent on China. And you can probably weave in uh, CETA in, this, in your answer. Thank you, Mr. Berekomand. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, obviously, the rise of China is one that uh, poses both tremendous challenges uh, around the world to uh, democracies and our trading systems, while at the same time providing um, a new and growing market for our goods and uh, goods and services that our citizens have come to rely on uh, over the past years. Uh, so it is one that we have to tackle, but tackle in a way that distinguishes uh, the different approaches we have to take with China. There will be things on which we will need to work together with China. For example, the fight against climate change, where they are significant uh, emitters of, uh, of uh, emissions, but at the same time are uh, working extremely hard to develop solutions from solar to others that they can uh, export around the world and use in, Can in, at, in their own country. So uh, there are areas which we will have to work alongside them. 
there are areas in which we're going to have to compete with China. Uh, the economic space, uh, trade space, but there are also areas in which we're going to have to challenge China on human rights, on Hong Kong, on the Uyghurs, uh, on uh, a range of things that we know are unacceptable. And having that approach, understanding that China is the second largest economy in the world, the largest country in the world, uh, outweighs any one of our countries significantly, requires us to work together. I remember a number of years ago, um, we were faced a, 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 a situation of challenge where our uh, Canadian, uh, Canadian airline company, Bombardier, that makes uh, make the, uh, the C-Series commercial aircraft that was later purchased by uh, Airbus, uh, was in real trouble. And uh, Airbus and Boeing, the two large uh, commercial airline producers in the country, in the world, uh, were challenging uh, Bombardier directly and trying to put it out of business. And China showed up to offer billions of dollars to keep all those jobs in that industry if we would only share that technology with them. And it was a conversation I had around the G7 table in, uh, in Sicily, actually, a number of years ago, uh, where um, Airbus and Boeing, following that, reflected, and Airbus ended up investing in Bombardier and saving those jobs uh, in Canada. But it is very easy for us, as friends and allies and competitors in so many marketplaces, to accidentally remain competitors in our desire to access Chinese markets or desire to get a better deal from China. And we need to make sure we are working together, understanding that the values that hold us together are more important than um, it, the small advantage in a trade deal. And that's where working together to create prosperity, to create more opportunities for trade is so important. And that's where on CETA, we've seen the benefits already of the work we're doing together. But I have a simple question. If a country like the Netherlands, known to be one of the great trading powers in the world over the past centuries, can't sign a free trade deal with Canada, with which country do you think the Netherlands could actually sign a free trade deal? Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Uh, the next one on my list is uh, Ms. Stine, Senator for the Democratic Party, D66. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for your leadership on gender equality. And we also appreciate very much that you're a he for she champion, because gender equality can only be achieved as also men speak up. What we have seen over the past 18 months is that the COVID-19 pandemic is a magnifying glass, glass like a magnifying glass for all kinds of equalities. And my question is, how can we in the Netherlands, in the European Union, learn from the lessons the Canadian feminist international assistance policy gives to really build better forward. And if you want to weave in CETA, that would be fine for us as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. And, and, and quite frankly, um, I feel that, that Canadians still have so much to learn from all of you uh, on gender equality, uh, on the work we need to do together, because that work is never done. Um, Yes, uh, we have to first and foremost recognize, even as our economies are bouncing back from, um, from the uh, worst impacts of COVID-19, uh, that recovery is uneven, just as COVID itself was uneven, uh, hitting women harder uh, and the areas, in the, uh, in the, uh, areas of work where uh, women and young people and uh, immigrants tend to be highly uh, more represented. Uh, were harder hit uh, through COVID-19. And indeed, some estimates have uh, put back uh, the advancement of women's rights uh, 10 to 15 years uh, because of COVID-19. 
uh, which is one of the reasons in Canada um, we made a decision to move forward on $10 a day childcare right across the country. And we will now, over the coming years, develop uh, a system um, that will ensure uh, that, that there is affordable, quality childcare uh, for everyone across the country, which we know um, has both community and family benefits, but significant economic benefits as well. Um, but it is not enough to do it just at home, uh, to move forward by um, bringing more uh, women into government. I have just named uh, earlier uh, this week my cabinet, last week my cabinet, uh, that is once again um, fully gender balanced. Oh, it was earlier this week, there we go. The time goes fast in politics. Uh, but as you talked about our international engagements and investments, um, that's something we recognize we have much more to do. A few years ago, we shifted towards um, a feminist international assistance policy. And what that means concretely is not just trying to help more women and girls, but understanding that often the easiest thing for countries to do in terms of international assistance is to work with some of those big international assistance organizations, outstanding ones, whether it be UNICEF or the Red Cross or, or Médecins Sans Frontières or any number of the great organizations out there, and they do a, a tremendous amount of positive work but there is also a need to reach deeper, to do more than just writing a check and sending it to trusted partners. There is a need to get out there on the ground and look for those small grassroots organizations. I remember speaking with uh, uh, Lima Bowie, who is uh, a tremendous uh, on-the-ground women's activist in Africa. Um, who was pointing out the leverage that happens when we ensure that those aid dollars get to the community organizations that are working so hard on the front line and don't get bogged down in all the processes and layers of work uh, that have been put in over the past many years. So my recommendation is as we look to continue to create opportunities, particularly coming out of this pandemic, which is hitting so hard, on the most vulnerable around the world, to be more active than just sending off a check and actually look to build those partnerships and those friendships and that empowerment of women at the grassroots level to be able to transform those communities and ultimately our world. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Deron from the uh, Party for Freedom House of Representatives, the floor is yours. In response to the question posed by my esteemed colleague, Mr. Brekelmans, who spoke about working together when dealing with uh, the challenges uh, China faces us with. Now, pundits are saying that Canada is conspicuously absent from the uh, Australia, US, UK um, safety treatment uh, act and um, now that, uh, after, now that we are after the liberation of the two Michaels after 1,020 days of inhuman imprisonment, I would like to ask you if you are reconsidering Canada's relation, relations with China. Uh, in fact, I'm curious to know what Canada's um, Indo-Pacific strategy will look like in the next years. Mm -hmm. I hope you can share your thoughts on that with us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duran. Uh, lots, uh, lots of interesting things in there. Um, first of all, Canada is a proud member of the Five Eyes Alliance. Uh, the uh, countries of uh, Canada, US, uh, Great Britain, uh, New Zealand, and Australia have a long-standing uh, security and economic partnership uh, that really dives into intelligence sharing in a way that is uh, effective and, and um, impactful, not just for our countries, but for our closest allies, whether it's through NATO or uh, other ways. Security, cooperation between allied and friends countries are incredibly important for us and, and indeed for the world. The recent agreement um, was based around the purchase of nuclear submarines. Uh, which is uh, something that Canada is not at this time in the market for. Uh, and certainly, uh, we are, are happy to see 
uh, our, our friends and colleagues working together. Uh, it will have no impact on the uh, continued cooperation and closeness of the Five Eyes group that we are part of. But the question on China remains a very good one. First of all, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, the Netherlands, uh, alongside many other allies and partners around the world for having spoken up so clearly and strongly, even in uncomfortable situations uh, with the Chinese government, to highlight that the arbitrary uh, arrest and detention of those two Canadian citizens um, was unacceptable and a uh, worrisome precedent for us all. And that's why um, we have all signed on to uh, a declaration against arbitrary, using arbitrary detention as a means of coercive diplomacy, and Canada's voice will continue to stand strongly uh, against that practice, uh, even as our two Canadian citizens have been returned home. Um, Canada continues to have very real concerns around China and human rights, uh, whether it's uh, the situation of the Uyghurs, uh, whether it's the situation in Hong Kong, uh, whether it's uh, concerns around the South China Sea. Um, there are a number of things or uh, tensions around Taiwan uh, over the past weeks uh, that we will continue to be a strong voice of uh, bringing up in concern. But we will also continue to look for ways uh, to engage constructively and productively, aligned with the rule of law, aligned with the uh, international rules-based order uh, and trading systems, because we cannot pretend that China isn't there. We cannot pretend that we're just going to cross our arms and ignore it. It is too important a player in our economies right now, but indeed in our economies into the future. And that's where, once again, uh, looking for ways to engage. We are a strong player in the Indo-Pacific uh, through whether it's uh, military presence in the Pacific as a Pacific nation, whether it's our partnership in APEC or in the CPTPP, um, we will continue uh, to ensure that as a trading nation, as a Pacific nation, uh, as well as an Atlantic nation, Canada remains engaged and strong in promoting our values and, quite frankly, promoting what we believe to be the right path forward for everyone. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, I would now like to give the floor to our colleague, Mr. Claver, from the Green Left Party uh, in the House of Representatives. Good morning, Mr. Prime Minister, and thank you for your inspiring speech, and thank you especially for your remarks on our common future, um, especially when you talked about the task of our generation to fight climate change. Um, and recently, uh, Canada has uh, had a new climate ambitions. You had the ambition, if I'm, not, if I'm correct, it's 40 to 45% uh, reduction by 2030. Um, and actually, I have a quite simple question. If I'm correct, this ambition is a little bit lower than the ambition of the European Union. Uh, so is it possible that you will announce next week at the COP in uh, in, um, in Glasgow, that you will, uh, that Canada will go for a much higher ambition when it comes to climate change, because in the way you talked about climate, I think it's so necessary that the United, of the, the European Union and Canada will go forward together. Thank you for your question. Um, one of the things I think we've all seen over the past, not years, but decades, from governments around the world is a lot of fanfare around targets. Around, we're gonna you know, hit this target for Kyoto. We're gonna hit that target for Paris. And unfortunately, so much of the energy is around setting the targets rather than digging into actually having a concrete plan, and roadmap to get there. One of the commitments I made at Paris six years ago was that even as Canada was stepping up in its climate leadership, we would not move forward on announcing targets where we didn't have a concrete and real plan to meet them. And that's what we've been working on over the past number of years. When we took office, we were on trajectory to miss our targets of 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. We bent that curve 
And we are now, if you look at where Canada is in 2021, positively and scientifically demonstrably on track to reaching 36% below those targets, the, the, the uh, 20, uh, 2005 levels. We have then layered on even more, pro more plans that is going to take us to the 40 to 45 percent by 2005, by, sorry, by 2030. And we will get to net zero by 2050. But again, saying net zero by 2050 is a lovely thing for me to say that I know I will not be held to account for voters for uh, in 2051. We need to make sure that every step of the way we are actually focused on the means to do it. And every country has different approaches and different challenges and different responsibilities. Canada is still one of the top fossil fuel producing countries in the world. That is a challenge that we face. It is something the world continues to need right now while we are still reliant on oil and gas. But in the coming years, as we develop technologies and new ways of doing things, the world will be uh, finding other alternatives. And we need to make sure we are transforming the jobs that workers are doing, the way uh, we do extract you know, the oil and gas that will still be needed, and mostly how we move beyond that through electrification. We've made concrete commitments around 100% zero emission vehicles uh, as new car sales in Canada by 2035, 50% by 2030, and a 100% green electric grid or net zero electric grid by 2035. Now, Canada is a long way along towards that right now. We're already well over 80% green in our electric grid. So the, we've already done most of the work of phasing out coal in our country. There are many things that we have done that means that simply saying, okay, we should really you know, hit this same car target as another country that has a very different situation isn't necessarily um, as simple as, as it seems. What we need to make sure is that everyone is pushing climate ambition as hard and fast as we can, and that's why the commitment we've made in terms of getting to net zero is to ensuring that oil and gas emissions are capped where they are now and will begin to decrease all the way down to net zero by 2050. Doing that for a country with a significant oil and gas uh, uh, production sector where other countries that are oil and gas producers like Norway, for example, have uh, had years of a head start because of political decisions that were made there and were not made in Canada uh, means that we will continue to look to do ever more and I will look forward to being able to announce even stronger targets as soon as we have the concrete plan to meet them. Because that habit we've gotten into as a world of making promises that we don't know how to keep has to end. And that's what we'll be looking at uh, at COP26, where even our commitments around international development financing for climate change, the pledge of $100 billion, was not met collectively by the world. That's why we've been working with Germany and others to make sure uh, that we're able to meet that target, and I think there's an announcement that we'll be able to meet that uh, uh, within the coming years. Thank you for your question. Nice hair. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Um, I'm very sorry, looking at the clock, uh, uh, I've uh, to round up this interesting exchange of uh, views. Uh, I thank the Prime Minister for his open and clear response to the very diverse questions of our colleagues in Parliament. And it is my pleasure now to give the floor to the Speaker of the Senate, Mr. Bruin.
Your Excellency, I would like to thank you for your presence here today. It was a great honor and a great pleasure to welcome you and your delegation. The pleasure of having you here today was even greater due to the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic prevented us from welcoming foreign guests for a long time. After we welcomed the president of Suriname in September, it was a privilege to also welcome a foreign prime minister in the Dutch parliament again for the first time since the start of the pandemic. Your Excellency, the former Queen of the Netherlands, Queen Beatrix, who spent four years in Canada during the Second World War as Crown Princess and went to school in the city of Ottawa, once said, the insight that your own well-being partly depends on other countries makes you look outward. Our strength lies not in isolation, but in cooperation. I think her words did not lose any of their relevance over the years. Progress is only possible if we work together on the international stage. In these times, with so many challenges that transcend the national level, like the COVID-19 pandemic, we should rely even more on the values of multilateralism and the rule-based world order. In this light, it is very important that politicians from countries all over the world continue to meet each other and discuss issues of mutual interest. Sometimes, just a meeting itself already sends out a message. That is why it is so valuable that you delight us today with this bilateral visit and why it is also so very much appreciated that you provided our members of parliament with the opportunity to exchange views with you here today on several very important topics. Of course, it is not only important to meet each other at the political level. Exchanges also in the field of business, education, science, tourism, and many other areas are just as important to contribute to mutual understanding between our countries and nations, to learn from each other, and to seek cooperation where possible. I'm happy to note that these exchanges between Canada and the Netherlands are extensive and fruitful in all of the mentioned fields. We fully trust that Canada will continue to play an active role on the global stage as a partner, a friend, and a pillar for international solidarity for the Netherlands and the European Union. Allow me to quote your father, the former Prime Minister of Canada, His Excellency Mr. Pierre Trudeau, by saying, the best thing you can possibly do for a friend is to be his friend. Canada has been a true friend of our country for a very long period of time. And your visit here today is another contribution to this long-standing friendship. In this light, I would not only like to underline again the role that Canada played in the liberation of our country, something that will never be forgotten, but also the continuous support of the Canadian government to pursue justice and accountability with regard to the downing of flight MH17, which also cost the life of a Canadian. Your Excellency, after your visit to the Netherlands, you will travel to Rome to attend the G20 Leaders Summit and to Glasgow to attend the UN Climate Conference COP26, where you will meet other world leaders to discuss important challenges that directly affect the people of our countries. 
I would like to wish you all the best for your participation in these conferences, as well as for the rest of your visit to the Netherlands. And to thank you once again for your presence here today. Thank you. Merci beaucoup.